Hello there, welcome to part zero of an Imperator Rome campaign where I make a video about me attempting to begin playing Imperator Rome. So we're here on the faction select screen. You can see there are quite a few choices. This game is essentially Crusader Kings 2 but in Rome plus 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 with some other stuff attached onto it. And it has a very big map with many factions. We've got a decision to make by the looks of things. I liked the idea of just playing as some random Tarim Basin city-state that nobody's ever heard of. Could be fun, but I figured we probably should be someone a bit more prominent than that. But then again, I didn't want to just play as like Rome, where you just win. I guess I wanted something a little bit interesting and different, because that's just how I roll. I eventually settled on... Argos, for a simple reason, I'm playing as Argos in Total War Troy, so that was a connection, that's an arbitrary thing to use, to decide between the thousands of choices. It's also somewhat strategic, because we start with three territories, and all the factions around us have one. So clearly I'm thinking of ganging up on them one at a time. It's a decent strategic plan to begin with, but there are many, many hurdles we'll have to overcome before we get there. I do start the game as Argos, and now we look at the screen. That's effectively what I'm doing, just looking at the screen, thinking, now what do I click on? I had actually played this game before, I've even got videos from this game, from when it came out. But since then, they changed everything because everybody hated it or something. So it's all a little bit different. And I figured, well, I'll just pick it up again by playing. I won't play the tutorial again or anything like that. Well, we've got a lot of tooltips to read. And of course, all of the actual deeper strategic meaning and the meta behind the tooltips will have to be picked up as we go along. I knew what I wanted to do. I was like, we just have to raise more troops than our neighbors because we have a bigger territory and defeat one of them. And then it will spiral up from there until we can swallow up all of our neighbours. That's the plan. We've got a lot of things to click on though, so we're clicking around the screen. I eventually find the technology tree, which is a little bit coffee stained, but otherwise looks good. We've got billions of technologies to unlock. You can actually start the game by unlocking a load of them. It's kind of like setting up your initial build. You don't start with a pre-scribed set of technologies unlocked. You choose what you start with which is nice, so I semi-randomly pick some techs. We've also got the ideas system, which is a bit like techs in that it does the same sort of thing, but it's just like a passive buff you put in the background, buffing one of the bajillion different numbers associated with your faction by an amount. So we are, again, semi-arbitrarily picking them. I won't really be commentating on that sort of thing because this is an abridged campaign, but for this part, I'm just going to say random things about what happened when I started the game. We'll get into the real game another time. Here was another interesting discovery. In the menu, you can just straight up turn off parts of the AI, which is strange because it feels like cheating. It feels like there should be a cheat menu being able to just stop the enemy from declaring war on you. But it's just a normal option. You can just decide the enemy can't attack you and there's no penalty for doing so or cost as far as I can tell. Well, that's handy. I decided not to use those features in order to be nice and fair. And that was the end of my Argos campaign. I hope you liked viewing it. Now we are starting again. This time I clicked the tutorial button. Yes, we're going to actually do this. The thing is, this game has an almost Battle Brothers-esque tutorial in that it doesn't really have a tutorial. What we have is it just starts the game as Rome, the easiest faction to play as, but it also gives you a list of tips about what you should actually be doing in the game. And that's what I needed, because I just didn't know what to click on or what I was supposed to do at all. So here we have a list we can follow. It says we have to stabilize Rome. We're already stable, which makes it a little bit confusing, but okay. It said something about looking in the religion menu. Here I am, looking in the religion menu. How long will it take me to find how we stabilize our country? I was really looking for a button that would say something like Divine Sacrifice on it. Well, there is a button, but unfortunately it's just a picture of a pig. It's th that very small one at the top. So as I was looking around for something that said Divine Sacrifice, I eventually found it when the tooltip for it appeared. There we go. 
needed a little bit more guidance to really hammer home how to actually do that particular action in the game. What I really needed from this tutorial here is an explanation of whether it's important or not to do that. We need the meta, like knowing where the button is or what the picture is supposed to be is one thing, but Knowing how much priority we should put on spending political influence to get stability is another thing. Like, should I get stability instead of something else? That sort of decision we'll have to make in the game. As it stands, it's going to be very hard to work that out by just analysing millions of tooltips. But that is what the game is. We do have to analyse millions of tooltips. This is actually where my second attempt at playing the game uh, came to a close. Because after doing that first objective and finding it slightly difficult because I couldn't find the button, I actually rage quit. You might think that's a little bit sensitive of me to already be out of patience, but it's because I often record footage for this channel at the end of the day, so I'm usually like already tired of staring at the screen all day and I'm already on the verge of having a headache or something and coming in here and finding it so difficult to click on a button that said perform divine ceremony and not knowing why I was doing it at all. I was just like, uh, I can't deal with this. So that was the end of my second attempt to play an Imperator Rome campaign. In a heroic twist though, I am back another time for part two of the tutorial where we'll try and get through the second tutorial objective. This time we're going to learn to invoke a deity. So we read this small textbook it provides on how to do this. It's something along the lines of, go in the religion menu and click on the Invoke a Deity button. Well, I come over here and that's really the end of my quest because just like with the Divine Sacrifice thing, there's no obvious Invoke Deity button. There's lots of space where it could be. I'm checking up here and I found this other button that says Invoke Devotio or something, kind of similar to what I'm looking for, but no, that wasn't it. So we just keep searching. Now I eventually found something that looks like it. This tooltip is talking about getting a benefit from a deity. And I, by chance, clicked on the picture that represents Mars. And that is actually how you invoke the deity. So we did it. That could have gone much worse. I could have been looking for a long time and never realized that picture was a button. So this is a lesson in user interface design. You can never overestimate how intelligent people will be. I will not work out how to use your UI. It really does need to be obvious. Because this tutorial is quite mean, I even have to go and tell the tutorial that I did the objective. It didn't even detect it for me. There we go. We invoked a deity. Mars has made our troops 6% more disciplined. Is that a good thing? Well, probably. Let's move on to the next goal. Build a port in Capua. So first we need to move the camera and find Capua. Miraculously, I do manage to do that, I even managed to click on it, but now things will get more difficult because this big and many faceted menu appears and the instructions just said, go to the build tab. Well, I eventually work out that this picture of a tablet with 2 slash 6 next to it means the build tab. That could have gone worse as well. We have various pictures of things we can build with gigantic tooltips, millions of effects coming with each one. I actually did mouse over the port early on, but it's going to take me a while to find it because all these tooltips were a bit overwhelming. For some reason, I just didn't detect that one of them did say port on it somewhere. There it is. We've discovered it. We're going to click on that button. Now a port will appear at some point at Capua. Incredible gameplay. We're now going to skip forwards a little bit in this tutorial. I eventually got to the point when I'd worked out how to make a claim on someone else's territory. This allows you to attack them. You click a button to make your army appear. It's like in Crusader Kings 2 where you're not building or training the army explicitly. You just have an army size based on what your economy is like. You click a button to make them appear and send them off. We can also wait around before starting the war because your morale in your army will improve if you're just hanging about for a bit, gathering a bit more and chilling. We'll set up on the border with the Sabines to the north, and then we can just stomp them. This is a number game, meaning whichever side has more number wins, and there are a couple of number to keep in mind. We've got morale, troop count, and general ability. We've also got lots of buttons that you might have seen 
on the army interface. What I'm going to do is play it safe by not clicking on those buttons. Here's a battle then, we charge on in to attack the Sabines, and they fight. We have more number than them in all three of the number categories, so we're going to win that battle. And there we go. Now we need to also start occupying their territory. We have a system similar to Crusader Kings where a siege bar is going up and every time it reaches the top there's a chance the siege will get a bit more in your favour. And if this happens enough times, the enemy might surrender and you're considered to be occupying the territory after that. Essentially, you don't have to do anything, you just have to wait. The only thing you need to keep in mind is that you can run out of supplies while doing that. All of your armies are carrying a certain amount of supplies need to keep that in mind. Skipping to the end of this war now, we essentially just steamroll not just the Sabines, but two other factions who were allied to them who didn't really put up much of a fight. We just had way more number than them, we even had some allies of our own helping out. So we annihilate them, and we take the territory of all three factions in the peace treaty. So even though we just claimed one tile with our initial Casus Belli, you can essentially just take anything involved in the war, which is nice. So there we have it, Rome is now clearly the most powerful faction in this area, and is probably going to do quite well. Here we have an example of the constant interruptions, which as they went on got more and more inconvenient for me. You are, as well as playing the military strategy part of the game, micromanaging some of the politics. It's kind of strange because it's very much in the background, but it also hamstrings what you can do, so you really need to pay attention to who all of these people actually are, and like manage their relationships, and in particular, manage whether they are loyal to the state or the leader or not. That aside, I was looking through the rest of the tutorial and figured, well, these objectives are just mostly conquer some other factions. We're now bigger than all of those factions. We can probably do it if we just gather enough number and send them in that direction. So I figured let's not even do that. Let's just go right back to what I wanted to do. I feel like I vaguely know how to play the game. It's time for Argos to rise. First, we are making a claim on this one tile right next to our borders. My belief at this stage is that because I have three tiles and they have one, we'll be stronger than them. That's not actually how the game works, but we'll get back to that later. I'm also going to build a ship and an aqueduct. This is entirely because in the tutorial it tells you to build some ships and an aqueduct. So this is my knowledge of the meta, I was like I suppose this is a good thing to do, maybe we'll need more ships and maybe the aqueduct is a good early game building. Whether it is I don't know because I don't have the analytical power to go through those gigantic full screen tooltips and add up all the percentages to the various values that's actually going on with all the different buildings. We're just doing this right now. We've got this invitation to join a defensive league and this defensive league system is going to make my plan much harder. Many of these small factions that I want to gobble up are in this league with each other, meaning attacking one is attacking all of them. We have to defeat all of their militaries at the same time, which is much more difficult than I thought it was at this stage and I already thought that sounds kind of annoying. We're going to not join the league ourselves because we want to be aligned against them soon enough, so I didn't want to deal with having to get out of an alliance that I was going to betray. While we wait for our war to start, I'm trying to figure out the government screen here, where it's talking about the various politicians and political factions. We've got some more politics pop-ups going through. We need to essentially placate various factions to try and get senatorial support, and if you have more than 50% support, then it's as if they will just be behind you whatever you do and you won't gain any tyranny points for taking actions on the campaign map. Right now, if we go and invade our neighbours we'll be considered a tyrant because our popular assemblies didn't support us doing it. And I think it is just black and white, either they will always support you or never support you based on what percentage of the politicians like you. And there's various things you can do here to influence whether they like you but it's a case where every time you do something for one faction, the other factions dislike you for doing it. The different factions have different levels of representation in the popular assembly, so some factions it doesn't really matter if they like you. How important it is to really micromanage this and keep everyone on side? Not sure yet, but there appears to be downsides to not interacting with it, which is a shame because I was all for not interacting with it. 
We get this alliance offer from Macedon, which is quite nice, the local superpower. We've also got this missions system here, which I quite liked, where you can do certain things. It's a little bit like the focus tree from Hearts of Iron, another paradox game. I'm actually not going to talk about that because it turns out to be much less important than I thought, but maybe that will come back later. Here we are, after our war justification has been made, I can invade our tiny neighbour. I can also call in my allies, I've allied myself to Macedon, Sparta and one minor faction, so we've got some good allies right now diplomatically. I'm going to ask Sparta to help, here's me becoming more tyrannical because the Senate doesn't support me doing this, but oh well, we're just going to do it anyway. As it happens, this military conflict is going to be absolutely nothing because we just walk into their territory, they don't raise an army. What could be the case is they already raise an army elsewhere and it walked off somewhere and died in one of their wars. And now we've just stepped in and we can occupy their territory. There are lots of wars going on. You can see plenty of troops moving around and doing stuff. It's mostly part of the Macedonians' antics. We do now, though, have an issue with civil war becoming something we need to keep in mind. A civil war is brewing, according to these things at the top, due to us having a lot of disloyal characters. And I remember when I first played this game, disloyal characters was a big thing you had to deal with. So it gives us some suggestions about who these people are. Various people in our government are disloyal. And I needed to work out why. Here we see an example. This guy is quite loyal, or he would be, if it wasn't for this power base in country debuff, which is massively lowering his loyalty. So what we have to do now as a new player is stare at that and try to work out what it means and what we're supposed to do about it. We do have some options for increasing characters' loyalty, like the bribe option you can see there, or give free hands, which is something I remember doing a lot last time. Essentially, let them be corrupt and they'll like you more. Perhaps there's a downside to doing that as well. We can look at a list of everybody in the government here and see various disloyal people. So... Civil war is going to happen if we don't do something, but I couldn't work out what to do. To me, obviously the biggest problem is this power base in country thing, and I was thinking if only we can solve power base in country being minus 20 something, maybe that would go away and everything will be fine? Well, we can't. I eventually just completely forgot about that whole situation and tried to power on the civil war is going to happen. In the meantime, our eventless, relatively bloodless war with our neighbour comes to a close. We take their territory, disband the army, and that was that. Very easy. We've already started justifying now our war on the next city-state over. So, despite me not knowing what's going on, the general plan is happening right now. We can expand our territory piece by piece and become a powerful faction. But yes, the civil war does interrupt things. And it's now in the civil war it begins to become more clear that the troop system in this game doesn't work like I thought it was going to. For example, we have 2,000 troops. The Civil War also has 2,000 troops. That's a bit strange because we raised our army from three different areas and they raised it from one. So why do we both have the same number of troops? Well, it turns out after going on Reddit and finding a post by the developer somewhere, I discovered that there is a formula for calculating how many troops your nation should have, and it is based on your population like I originally guessed, but there's also a cutoff where below that cutoff it's not based on that. So essentially, until you have a certain number of people, you will just always deploy 2,000 troops, meaning tiny regions can deploy 2,000 and medium-sized regions will also deploy 2,000. Therefore, by starting as a bigger faction than the other city-states, I actually don't gain any military advantage. I do have a lot more pops, but we haven't reached the threshold. And from my later experiments, we're actually nowhere near the threshold. 2,000 is the amount of troops that we shall have, and there's not too much we can do about that, as far as I know. Fortunately, our general was one number higher than their general. So in our battle of 2,000 versus 2,000 in the Civil War, we were able to win, we can start taking back our territory and further beat their army down now. That's something, but this whole 2000 conundrum will be coming back to haunt me later. 
By later, I actually mean right now upon retrospect, because just after this we're going to run into some issues with lack of troops. You might notice there, the guys I was going for, Hermione, have been conquered by their neighbours, meaning our next war has been put off, we need to justify against the new neighbours now so we can invade them instead. We've got this issue at the top, something like bad research ratio with a tooltip attached. I didn't even begin to introduce myself to nearly partially having a chance of understanding what this was talking about. Something's wrong on this screen, we're just not going to look at it, I don't even slightly know what to do. Here's the other issue that I alluded to. We don't have enough troops right now because that 2000 number is magical in this game because that's the number of troops you need minimum to take a territory if that territory is fortified. So we can't take that territory. We need to wait for our manpower reserves to filter into the army, which will mean there are no people left in our country, but we'll still have those 2000 troops to take territory. Or we can do what I just did there, ask Sparta to come and do it for me. So I think Sparta is now involved in our civil war. I hoped they would come and claim the civil war territory and that would be that. Long story short, they didn't. But we eventually got all of our people back into the army and got that territory back. The civil war is over. We can now focus on our next war. We're going to attack Troy's end since we finished the justification while all that stuff was happening. We pop off the war, we can again get Sparta to help us out with the fight. There's not much here by the looks of things, or is there? After I give the order to march forwards, their army sort of spawns in front of us, they levied it right then. They also won because their commander is much better than mine. Then they beat us again in quick succession, and that's that. We just lost most of our troops. We already have drained our population into the army, as mentioned, so we can't really get them back. We're gaining 11 people per month, so it's going to take us a long time to build up an army like that again, and the enemy army is at full strength. We're screwed, but we do have Sparta. Sparta could go in and take the enemy out. The only problem is they don't, so... Not really sure what to do now, it's going to be very hard for us to do anything in the war, we completely rely upon our allies to fight it for us, but they're not hugely interested in doing that. It seems there's lots of consideration going on here, the two AI armies keep walking at each other, and our side definitely has the number advantage, but they don't seem willing to commit. And in fact right there they uncommitted, they're walking home, and the enemy are starting to take our territory. Great! And the main reason I'm salty about all this is that if we'd been able to raise more than 2,000, we would have been able to step over their border safely and just stomp them. It is this 2,000 magic number thing that caused us to have equal armies, despite it being us with the giant population advantage. This here, by the way, is me poking around the military screen, trying to work out why we don't have more troops than them with our population, especially because we've already seen that two of the regions in our territory can raise 2,000 troops themselves because they've already done it against us. Well, actually, our first enemy didn't do it, I suppose, but I think they must have done it to someone else before we attacked them. Something, something, something. I don't really know why we don't have many troops, but we don't have enough. There are no humans left to harvest for whatever reason. That number didn't really go up as we expanded our territory either. Not much we can do now. I started negotiating for peace, not wanting to lose everything in this war. Here's an example of these pop-ups being annoying to me, like I'm trying to work out how I can get this peace treaty to work and navigating the peace treaty interface in general, and then this other thing appears on top of it and I have to deal with this new tooltip system where like six different things will happen if I pick an option, I have to work out if that's a good thing or a bad thing in some way, which at this stage I'm probably just guessing. Anyway, that goes away. Here's the peace treaty I eventually settle on. It doesn't look very good. Maybe we could have got a better one than that. I don't know. We gave Troizen all of our excess territories, and now we are just our city-state. It's just Argos. I guess that's the important part to have. And because of that Magic 2000 system, we probably have the same military strength as them, even though they now have a couple of city-states in their territory. Well, that's something, but it's not very much. We can't generate any more humans to put in the military anyway. So that's the end of that. Essentially, we could stand here for a long time, eventually regenerate our troops, and then go back to our project. But of course, at this stage, simply starting the game again would be functionally the same gameplay-wise and would take less real-life time. 
So that's why this is the end of part 0, and coming soon, part 1. Did I actually learn enough in part 0 to make part 1 a success? We're going to find out the hard way as we come back with some new hard-won knowledge about the game to maybe make a bit of progress? We'll see. Feel free to post your walkthroughs in the comments, by the way, although you should also know that I'm going to be playing as far ahead as possible before this video comes out, so a lot of whatever tips you give me simply will not be influencing what happens at the start of the real campaign and such. It is always like this with my campaigns, I always try to get as far ahead as possible early on to have some nice pure early game with no outside influence, in order really just to see how the game works and enjoy it in the quote unquote as intended fashion. Sometimes it's more fun to not be forced to read the walkthrough, sometimes it isn't though, this might be one of the games where you're supposed to know what's going on in advance, like Battle Brothers. Well, who knows? Whatever happens, I'm going to tell you about it, and it might be interesting. I'll see you next time.